What's going on, everyone? Welcome into the Two Stripes Podcast, the podcast that covers everything happening in the world of college football. My name is Colton Denning, and I am your host. want to welcome you into the show, soundcloud.com slash two stripes pod, and Apple Podcasts is where you can find the show, youtube.com slash Colton Denning. You can also find the show there and some cool college football highlights. I think if you go to the YouTube channel, you will like what you see a lot of new highlights under the radar players, and some old school highlights. I just put up a 20-minute video of Percy Harvin at Florida. And if you were around for the Percy Harvin era, you remember what type of player he was down in Gainesville. And even if you weren't around, go check it out and learn yourself because he was a hell of a player and it was super fun putting that together. And I think all college football fans should be able to watch Percy Harvin highlights. But I've got his video up there couple other old school videos, a lot of Ohio State stuff, and more on the way, so check it out, youtube.com slash Colton Denning. Anyway, enough about me cutting videos. This is a platform for my failing and fledgling podcast, so let's get right to it. Since we're creeping up on spring ball, most teams start here in the next couple of weeks, I wanted to get back on the podcast bandwagon and start talking about teams. And I had the chance a couple of weeks ago to sit and chat with Thomas Kenzora, one of the managing editors over at TestudoTimes.com, Maryland's SB Nation blog, about Maryland and how they're going to look this upcoming season and some of the biggest stories for them in the offseason. Of course, whenever you're talking about Maryland, the focus has to kind of shift to what happened last year off the field with DJ Durkin and the tragic, unfortunate death of Jordan McNair and everything that happened in that situation, and that really clouded over their season, and it was the main talking point for them. So they're under a lot of transition. Mike Loxley returns to Maryland from Alabama, went to Nick Saban's head coaching school, got rehabilitated, and he's back there now. So Thomas and I talked a lot about that shift and what Loxley brings his reputation as a recruiter, and the direction of the Maryland program under him. Something to note here, we recorded this interview before former Virginia Tech quarterback Josh Jackson transferred in, so that's another name to watch for in that QB battle. He was a kid that had a lot of success his freshman year at Virginia Tech, kind of got phased out of that offense, but a guy that has some potential and I think has two seasons of eligibility left. So another piece for Loxley and that offensive staff to work with. But we recorded this a couple of weeks ago before that. So something to note. Even with that though, I think that there's a lot of insightful stuff here. And even whether you're a Maryland fan or not, I think that you will enjoy it. So let's get right to it. Here's my discussion with Thomas Kenzora of Testudo Times. I am super excited to be joined on the podcast by one of the managing editors for Testudo Times, and his name is Thomas Kenzora. Thomas, what's going on, man? Thanks for joining the show. Thanks for having me. I'm doing all right. So there's there's a lot to talk about when it comes to Maryland, and we're in that portion of the college football offseason where we're, we're past signing day. Spring practice hasn't started yet. Spring games are, are far away, and of course the season's super far away, but I'm, I'm really interested to hear a lot of the stuff from your perspective about Maryland because the last year has been pretty crazy for them and a lot of stuff has changed and a lot has happened. What What's it been like for Maryland fans, people around the program, just watching everything that's happened around the football team and the university the last year? Yeah, so I will, you know, I'll say right up front, like we, we had talked about, you know, me coming on a little while ago and I said, I actually kind of want to wait at, until kind of after signing day because, there was still a lot of uncertainty. Like Maryland was still in the process of hiring a staff, still in the process of what kind of recruiting class could they put together? Because after all the stuff that happened at Maryland, which I don't know how much of that we really need to go into now. I spent like all of last semester talking about it. But after all that, you know, there was really nothing as far as a recruiting class. They had, I think, 10 commits when they hired Mike Loxley and only a few of those even ended up staying. I think they signed six kids on the first signing day and they, they ended up with a class of 17 and 
Loxley took a while to hire an, you know, a staff of assistant coaches, and there was a little bit of drama all there. The outlook, I would say, is a lot more positive now than it was a couple weeks ago. And I think a lot of that is the way the recruiting class came together late. Mike Loxley, you really you hire him because of his recruiting chops. He's been at Maryland before. He's the guy who's responsible basically for getting Stefan Diggs to Maryland. He was the guy who was responsible for Damian Prince, who was at the time a five-star offensive tackle coming to Maryland. If Dwayne Haskins was committed to Maryland because of Mike Loxley and went to Ohio State when Mike Loxley was not retained, and that seems important. Yeah, and uh, let's just jump right into talking about Mike Loxley because he comes on after a 5-7 and seven season. He's done his apprenticeship over at Alabama under Nick Saban. Like you said, he's he's been around the program before, so it's not like this is a new face. And whenever really anybody outside of the DMV area talks about the DMV area, it's always like recruiting. You got to have strong ties to that area. And if you want to talk about guys with strong ties, he, he really is one of the first names that pops up. Is that kind of everybody's, is that the linchpin for them going forward that, Hey, you know, we're going to be able to recruit kids from this area. Not only that, but stop kids that, like you said, Haskins from going to Ohio state, uh, digs his little brother. I don't know if he was in that area as Stefan was, but he goes down to Alabama, and it really seems like that's going to be their linchpin, and especially in the Big Ten East where you have three teams at the top that recruit very well. It seems like that's Maryland's play here, and it seems like it's a smart one. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's one that, you know, they've always gotten a handful of guys from the area who, you know, are from Maryland. They have, you know, a certain level of Maryland pride to them. DeMatha Catholic, which is, you know, that's where Chase Young went and where like 12 blue chippers are every year, it seems. You know, Anthony McFarlane, Maryland's running back, who destroyed Ohio State. Uh, like that he, he went did. there too. And so, you know, that school is five minutes from Maryland. It's in Hyattsville. You know, for, for a lot of these kids, Maryland is the local school. And, you know, so it, it's an easy pitch if you can do it right and if you can win enough is, is stay home and be part of something great right here. And DJ Durkin was recruiting well before uh, things happened. And I think Mike Loxley will probably continue that trend of recruiting well. And it'll be, it really, you know, the, the question then becomes, can he win and sustain a winning program, which no one's done at Maryland in a while. So he's going to have to do that come the season time. But until then, what do you think are, are some of the biggest things that him and his staff have to accomplish this off season to really get that ball rolling as we head closer to the 2019 season. Yeah. So for me, I mean, the first thing with Loxley was just the trust, whoever Maryland hired as a coach. And the reason that it, you know, not a lot of names ended up coming up for the job because they kind of figured out that Loxley was the one that everyone trusted. Like Jordan McNair's dad was at Loxley's press conference and he had no, he's known Loxley for a long time. And like, if the McNair family, who lost a son because of basically institutional incompetence at Maryland, trusts the new guy, then I think we all have reason to at least believe in the new guy. So that, I mean, that kind of came together quick. Loxley hired what I would say is a pretty good staff. There were some guys that he would like, he was reportedly going to hire, but the coaching shuffle was wild and he ended up getting the short end of more sticks than, than not with like Butch Jones, Josh Gaddis, things like that. But staff seems pretty good. They had to put together a real, you know, a recruiting class kind of late. And I think the biggest thing they did was get Lance Lejean, a four-star quarterback out of new Orleans who Florida state was on him for a year. Maryland was on him for two weeks and he chose Maryland. Yeah. That's not a bad pull. And that that's something where you can really, you know, you, you really see the difference that a guy like Loxley and a staff that can recruit can make to to just go in at the last minute and, and be able to pull those type of kids. When it comes to X's and O's or just fit standpoint, how do you think that this staff and the players mesh, at least in year one? I'm not entirely sure just because, you know, we haven't seen whatever sort of a system Loxley would run as a head coach, how similar it is to... Uh, what Alabama ran because Maryland's personnel 
they're, I mean, they have a lot of playmakers on offense. They're not Alabama, and they definitely don't have Bama's offensive line. And so you, you probably would have to adjust a handful of things. I think most likely Tyrell Pigram would be the week one starting quarterback. He's a dual threat guy. You would ideally want to run heavy offense, but there are a lot of playmakers at wide receiver as well. So, you know, I think when a new staff comes in, they it usually isn't that hard to figure out, you know, what kind of scheme fits the personnel. I'm reasonably optimistic, at least for now, that they'll be able to find something that works. We've seen Maryland be very adept at being a home run hitting team the last couple of years. We saw it against Texas in 2017. We saw it against Texas in 2018, and we damn sure saw it against Ohio State in that crazy game this past season. Now that you have, you know, a guy in Loxley that has that experience at Alabama, is that going to continue to be kind of what we see from the offense? Is a lot of home run hitting. You're going to see a lot of athletes out in space. And, and what can we expect from the offense in 2019, do you think? To me, that just depends on, you know, how the quarterback is. Like, I thought Maryland's offense last year would have been a lot more home run hitting because – I thought Kasim Hill was okay against Texas and then really struggled for a lot of the year towards ACL. Tyrell Pigram looked, you know, really good against Ohio State, looked overwhelmed against Penn State on the road. And so it, it really starts with quarterback play, and quarterback play is still kind of an unknown. But assuming it's at least competent, I think, yeah, there there will be probably a lot of home run hitting just because of the personnel that they have. You know, they have Anthony McFarland, who, has, as you've seen, can just break free on any play. Ty Johnson doesn't, he, he won't be around anymore, but they have Javon Leak, who had a game like that against Illinois, and then several wide receivers who emerged, you know, kind of in that Ohio State game. And uh, Jay Sean Jones was the one who emerged against Texas too. So a lot of playmakers and then kind of a question mark at quarterback. It's, it's a really interesting recipe. What does the defense look like? Because we're looking at a group that finished 51st in defensive S&P plus last year, 72nd in success rate. And they didn't do a ton really great, and they didn't do a ton that was just super awful. What do you think the next steps are for them to get to a point where they can play, you know, top 40, top 35 defense? Well, it's a little tricky. They they lose a, de- a decent amount on defense. The top two pass rushers are gone. Byron Cowart and Jesse Annabonum. Probably more noteworthy is that Trey Watson's gone. He was he emerged as by far their best defensive player last year as a grad transfer and Darnell Savage the safety is gone and so they return most of the rest of the defense but those are Watson and Savage in particular are two of the you know were arguably their two best defensive players and their top two pass rushers with at a position where there isn't a lot of proven depth at all so John Hoke was kind of an underwhelming defensive coordinator hire as well he hasn't been a sole defensive coordinator since the year of our lord 2001 <laughs> that's a long time it's been a while it was uh it was with steve spurrier at florida by the way which for for reference <laughs> i gotta say anytime the last back when time somebody took a job was vhs tapes yes with anybody when anybody's last college job was when i was 11 i i get a little yeah. worried about that oh i was four that's <laughs> i'll one-up you on that damn you're making me feel old <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I was watching Thomas the Tank Engine on VHS, and John Hoke was the defensive court. Anyway, so I, I guess I'll have to start watching. I don't, I don't know. But it, th- there's a lot of question marks on defense. I don't know what kind of scheme they'll run necessarily. I think they'll run 3-4 is what I've heard, and I think Loxley said something about it somewhere. In which case, the, the big addition right now is Keandre Jones, who... I'm not really sure what his eligibility status is. I don't think you transfer now if you're not going to be eligible just because he has one year left and he's enrolled at Maryland now. So I, I, I believe the idea is that he will be a grad transfer similar to what Trey Watson was. Now, obviously, you can't hold him to the same standards as Trey Watson because Watson led the Big Ten interceptions as a linebacker. But, I mean, Jones has you know the opportunity. I think he should most likely slide into a starting spot. And if he can be an impact player, that'll really transform sort of the outlook of the defense. Um, They got a couple pass rushers late in the recruiting cycle, but that's also a place where I think they 
are still going to explore the transfer market. Yeah, somebody that's watched Keandre Jones over the past couple of years, I, I've been super bummed out that he hasn't seen the field. And, you know, we talked about John Hoke. As somebody that watched Greg Schiano coordinate a defense, I can – I can speak to subpar uh, defensive coordinating, and it, it definitely was disappointing that he wasn't on the field, and I don't think that was any fault of his own. So I am very excited to watch, hopefully to get to see him on the field because it, it, I'm sure that there are Maryland fans that remember from his recruitment just how talented and athletic of a player he is. And I think he kind of got a raw deal at Ohio State. So if he's on the field, I would not be surprised if you know he really shows out because – He's a hell of an athlete, and if Maryland has any sort of competent linebacking coaching, then I think that he's a guy that you can really look for to step up as a leader of the defense and to break out amongst you know Big Ten linebackers or Big Ten defenders that not a lot of people know about. And I think the linebacking coaching should be competent. Uh, Brian Williams, they hired from UAB, and they also are using John Papuchas as a special teams coordinator and inside linebackers coach. So they're they're kind of doubling up at the linebacker spot and using someone who was a power five defensive coordinator last year in Papuchas as as one of those guys. What's the level of optimism like or what's the general temperament of the fan base like right now as as we get closer to spring practice about uh, the new direction of the program, this team in general, 2019, the future of Maryland football, just everything surrounding it. I think it's a little bit more cautious optimism. I think Loxley brought back a lot of the hope that had been missing. I think a lot, you know, because Maryland was a program that needed to hit the reset button. And I think whenever you hire a new coach, it feels like you've kind of hit the reset button, especially because he really didn't, you know, he didn't retain a single on-field assistant coach. So it's, it's 10 new guys. The problems that led to what happened last year go far beyond what's going on in football. Um, you know, that's whole, that's all athletic department, university leadership stuff too. And like the athletic director is the same for some reason, the president's the same. So like, as far as all that goes, there's still a little tension, animosity among some of the fan base, but most fans are optimistic with uh, Loxley, especially with the 2020 recruiting class locally being probably the most talented class we've had in the DMV in a long, long time. And with how he closed 2019, that there is a lot of optimism for that. Final question here for you. What do you think the expectation of Mike Loxley's Maryland era should be? I think... Well, are you talking first year or like kind of down the road? I guess at first year and then down the road. What do, you, what do you think is a fair expectation for 2019 and then for Mike Loxley's tenure? I think in the first year, you, you kind of just want to get back to a bowl game after missing two in a row. The schedule is tough again, you know, with the nine Big Ten games. They have a little, actually a little less luck with uh, the crossover opponents than they did um, this past season. And the non-conference includes Syracuse, which is much harder than uh, it was when the, that game was scheduled. And it includes at Temple, who beat them in College Park. Um, but there, there are enough possible wins on the schedule that I think it's reasonable to hope that they can go 6-6. Six and six. I think long-term, I don't know how much uh, like the, the ceiling for the program has changed. I always think the realistic ceiling is being a program on the level of what Michigan State is where you know you have kind of an identity and on an up year you can contend for you know maybe a Big 10 division crown make the title game if you win, you know have a decent chance to win that if you're coming out of the east you know just on an up year but then you know consistently be 7 8 9 win team you know to me i think most maryland fans would be kind of fine with that cuz it's and then focus their anger toward basketball but <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for at least for now, even with the facilities on the rise and whatever else, it's hard for me to see them going too far beyond that. I think that that's a, a very fair expectation, especially with with the talent in that area. And like you said, this 2020 recruiting class could shape up for them to, to be pretty special. And when you have a guy like Loxley that can recruit, if you're able to coach him up as well, that can be a game changer. And I know that from an outsider's perspective, Maryland is – one of the more, 
I think, interesting programs to watch from the outside because of where they are, where they're placed, and just that everything always seems to be just very interesting there at Maryland. So I know I'm super yeah, excited. Yeah, it's never boring. Like they they no. turned the, <laughs> they turned Cole Fieldhouse into like honestly the most beautiful place I've ever seen. Like the most beautiful football practice field I've ever seen. It's a whole hundred yard indoor practice field. It's with a ninety foot roof that you can you can really punt in it too. It's like this amazing thing, and they're gonna they're still expanding it. And also, like Maryland doesn't have a ton of money anymore. <laughs> I know that people like to talk about like sleeping giants and them in in North Carolina inevitably come up, but I think you hit on a good point that. You know, a lot of fans just want to be able to steadily win seven, eight, nine games per year. And then in that Michigan State vein, hey, if you have a, a group of upperclassmen that are around, you know, the, the same the same year, you've been able to redshirt a couple of classes over and build up some depth, have some talent at the skill positions, get a good quarterback. And, you know, you catch a year where you get Michigan and Penn State at home and Ohio State's a little bit down or whatever however that may work out you can contend for a, a Big Ten East crown I think that that's legitimately a ceiling for them and, and that's probably not asking too much and with the resources and you know the way that I guess what their what their ceiling is and what their floor could be and should be that that seems like it's it's very reasonable and it's one of those things that it probably builds on itself. Like if enough local recruits say, okay, I'll come here. And then they start actually winning, then more recruits are going to want to do it. And then, you know, I think you could, you could build like a borderline championship caliber, like recruiting team based mostly on DC, Maryland, Virginia recruits. And like maybe a few other places. Like there's enough talent in the area. I hate to compare it to Clemson because we've seen what, Clemson ha has done in the past five or seven years and I, I certainly don't think that Maryland can do that and, and have that level of success but you know I, I look back at where Clemson kind of was when I was 10 15 years old and they were always near the top 25 and you know they were able to explode in in the way that they were able to recruit in the program that they built it seems like if Loxley is the guy for Maryland and he's just able to give them stable footing and just have a base and an identity of what they want to do that, you know, being around the top 25 isn't an unreasonable thought or expectation for them. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's, you know, completely out of the question. And we'll, we'll see how good of an infield coach like Mike Loxley is. Like, there are reasons to be kind of cautious with him. His one previous head coaching job was a pretty <laughs> emphatic disaster and like he's been at Maryland and there's Maryland was was good kind of in his first tenure as an assistant and pretty bad in his second tenure as an assistant so you know he, he's talked about he knows what it was like when the team was winning and he kind of wants to recapture that so when he says that you can't help but be optimistic but only time will tell only time will tell you are correct about that but it should be a lot of fun watching Maryland and how that program progresses under Mike Loxley. And if you want to do that, make sure to check out TestudoTimes.com. Also follow them on Twitter at TestudoTimes. Thomas, where can they find you? I am at tkenzora 37 So that's K-E-N-D-Z-I-O-R-A. Follow Thomas on Twitter. Follow everything going on with Testudo Times and keep up with everything Maryland. Thomas, it was great talking to you. Can't wait to see what they do this year. And thanks for joining the show, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Big thanks to Thomas for joining the show. I hope that that interview didn't age too poorly in the two weeks that I had to keep it in the can because of work stuff and not put it out. So I hope you enjoyed it. I thought it was really cool to get his perspective on everything that's happened there and what Maryland looks like going forward because like we talked about in the interview, they're one of those programs that's just intriguing to look at because there's so much talent in that area and now when you have teams like Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan, and even Alabama just coming in and really rating it for those top players, you've got a guy like Mike Loxley now who's an ace recruiter. How does that pan out? So something to watch. And I know as an Ohio State fan, I'll be very interested to see 
what they're going to be able to do in recruiting against those bigger programs. We'll also get to see what a lot of other teams in college football are going to look like this season as spring practice basically is here. I know a lot of teams are starting next week. It looks like Maryland is starting March 26th, so less than a month away, but it's all coming together. Spring practice is about to start, and we're going to get a look at Maryland and the rest of these teams, and I couldn't be more excited. So I'll have more about that coming up here in the next couple of weeks as I try to figure out what other teams to preview and what else to talk about here in this offseason as we try to get through it in March toward the 2019-20 season. I hope you guys have enjoyed today's show. Whether you're a returning listener or a first-time listener, be sure to go to soundcloud.com slash twostripespod to find the show there and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Leave a review. Leave me some feedback. I am on Twitter at Dubsco, and you can find this episode and all my other college football videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash Colton Denning. But until next time, I want to thank you one last time for listening to the show. My name is Colton Denning, and this is the Two Stripes Podcast.